Now, do we think that patients whose brains have irreversibly ceased to function really are dead? That's the next question. Let's put aside one issue that might mislead and distort your thinking about the issue that I'm trying to talk about or direct your thinking away from the issue I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the reliability of the determination of brain death. Okay? Every now and again you will read of a case somebody who a doctor said was brain dead or maybe two doctors or more said was brain dead um, but they were not for some reason immediately removed from the respirator and certainly their hearts were not removed from their bodies and then they recovered. Doctors can make mistakes. I think we probably all know doctors can make mistakes. They can even make mistakes about something as important as the determination of death and you can even have a situation where more than one doctor makes the same mistake in this situation. So that's true. And what we ought to do about that is an interesting question. Um, you know, how many doctors we ought to have or whether we ought to get them to repeat tests or something of that sort. Um, there are definitely ethical questions that arise from this. But it's not possible to recover from brain death. Death is defined, brain death is defined as the irreversible cessation of all brain function. When brain death has been correctly diagnosed, you are actually dead. And we often don't think of people in this way. Here is uh, a case like that. Look at the newspaper headline. This is a woman who, when you read the text, um, had been declared brain dead. Her brain had totally ceased to function. But her bodily functions were being maintained because she was pregnant. And um, the, her husband and the father of the child said that he wanted her bodily functions to be maintained so that the child could develop a little further. The child at the time was too premature to be delivered so that the child could develop to a point where a a uh, C-section could be performed and the baby could be born healthy, which is what happened. And this is by no means the only case of this kind. There have been several cases of pregnant women who have been declared brain dead, but their bodily functions have been kept going, sometimes for as long as three months, so that a healthy baby could be born. Now, um, one thing about this is look at the newspaper headline. So say when you read the the text of the article, the text of the article clearly says that uh, her brain function had ceased last month. But it also says she'd been kept alive with a respirator. Well, if we believe in the definition of brain death, if her brain function had ceased, and there's no reason that this, this was irreversible, she didn't recover, although the baby was delivered, um, then she's not actually alive. She's not being kept alive. Her bodily functions are being maintained but if you use language properly and you accept the definition of death in terms of brain death, she is dead. So you can't say she's being kept alive. What that suggests is that in some way we don't quite believe this definition of death. And that's not really very surprising when you think of these cases, right? You think of what's going on and you compare it with the standard definition of death um, and with the idea that John Cleese has in the dead parrot speech, it's, it's a stiff, right? So this, this woman um, was, her, her, she was, she was breathing with a respirator, admittedly. Her blood was circulating, her heart was beating, her, um, her uh, body was warm, um, it was soft to the touch, it was not uh, rigor mortis, was, was not setting in, um, and she had a viable fetus inside her which continued to grow. So the placenta was functioning, the fetus was being fed, she of course was being fed through a tube so that she was being nourished. Um, it's very hard uh, to think of a person like that as dead. And it's not surprising that we find popular newspaper accounts using language like this, saying she's being kept alive. So is there a reason for thinking that she is dead, despite all that that's going on, that such patients are dead? Why do we think that? Why do we think that if the brain 
in particular if the whole brain, which is the definition of death, has ceased to function, why do we think that that makes you dead? And incidentally, the definition of death, the legal definition, as you saw a moment ago with the Uniform Determination of Death Act, is that all brain functions have irreversibly ceased. It's now been shown in some research that in patients who are declared brain dead, there is some brain, some brain functions often continue. The brain um, obviously has uh, the function of the nervous system and of brain cells, that kind of uh, electrical activity that you're familiar with, and that's probably what you think of as the brain's function. But the brain has other functions too, including producing hormones. Um, so it's been shown that in some people where there is no electrical activity in the brain, hormones may still continue to be produced. Now there are other parts, other bodily organs that produce hormones as well, of course. Um, does that matter? Is it important that they stop as well before somebody is brain dead? Why? Why would we think that whether the brain is producing hormones matters or not? That's another puzzle about this situation. So why does anybody think that the death of the whole brain means that you're dead? There are three views that are, that are worth considering here. And the death of the whole brain view is the middle one of these three views. So on the one hand, you have this traditional view, the one I gave you in, in uh, the law dictionary, irreversible cessation of heartbeat and circulation. Then we have the view that we've just been talking about, that death can be the irreversible cessation of all brain functions. And then we have a view I haven't mentioned yet, but uh, I will because it's important to that question that I began with, is what is it that we think really matters in human death? And this is what you can call higher brain death or cortical death. It's the irreversible cessation of, or the irreversible loss of consciousness, um, which means the irreversible cessation of all cortical brain functions. Okay, so we have the cortex and we have the brain stem. The Uniform Definition of Death Act said all brain functions, including the brain stem. But if you only have the brain stem, you're not conscious anymore. The brain stem is what regulates bodily functions that continue even when you're unconscious, when you're asleep or when you're in a coma. So the brain stem regulates your breathing and heartbeat. Um, but um, it's not, doesn't seem to be part of consciousness. So we could have this third definition of death, which is that it's the irreversible loss of consciousness that's important. And that makes some intuitive sense because if you think about what you would feel, when you would feel, suppose you've got a close friend or a, or a family member, and if you think about under what circumstances might I feel that my friend no longer exists, he's no longer there. Would I think that he's still there if his body is warm and his heart is beating and his blood is circulating, but he is permanently unconscious? He will never recover consciousness. I'll never be able to speak to him, he'll never be able to respond to me in any way. Well, I think many people would think under those circumstances, then I've lost him or her. He's gone. So that might be a reason for going for the third view, for moving on from brain death to higher brain death. So the question that we're looking at is, so we have moved in law from just the first to the second, or to the first and the second combined. Is there a justification for doing that that is not also a justification for moving to the third possibility? Here's one justification that's in your reading from the book by Griset and Boyle, who are defending a traditional view here. Um, they, they're, they're, uh, they're Catholic theologians, moral, uh, moral philosophers, um, and they are defending the notion of, of brain death, um, and they are saying death is the irreversible loss 
of integrated organic function. And they're saying the role of the brain is to produce that kind of integrated organic function. And once the whole brain ceases to function, then the dynamic equilibrium, as they call it, is lost. Decomposition of the body begins. Essentially, you start, you start to rot. Um, and surely, then you're dead. But of course, that's not really true, given the medical technologies that we have. You can't say that a woman who is supported on respirators and with tube feeding and so on in a hospital for three months while her fetus develops to the point at which it can survive, you can't say that her body is decomposing. It's obviously not. Um, so the dynamic equilibrium can be preserved. Yes, it's being preserved artificially, but that doesn't matter. We don't think people are dead because some of their functions are being supported artificially. So it doesn't seem to be true that the death of the uh, whole brain is the irreversible loss of integrated organic functioning. And here's another case that I think makes that view implausible. This is a condition called locked-in syndrome, which in a way is sort of the mirror image of brain death. Because what you have is no ability to move your body, but you have consciousness. And um, here's a patient called Eric. Um, he has no control over his body except over his eyes because of an injury. Um, so he can only communicate by moving his eyes. Now, he's got, a, in fact, a brain stem. He's not on a respirator, as you can see. So his brain stem is functioning. But just imagine a thought experiment. Just imagine that his brain stem began to fail while his consciousness was still continuing, while the other parts of his brain were still continuing. And imagine that we have the technology to replace the brain stem, so, or to replace the functions of the brain stem, as we do. Put him on a respirator, get him breathing, um, give him tube feeding, and whatever else it needs. If his remaining consciousness, right, you would then say the integrative functions of the brain have been lost. His brain stem is not integrating the body. And he's only being, it's only being provided artificially. But he's conscious and he's able to communicate with us still, let's say, by moving his eyes. Nobody's going to say he's dead. He's able to answer questions by eye blinks. Can't possibly say he's dead. So the fact that integrated functioning is being supported only artificially cannot be a reason for thinking that someone is dead. That just doesn't seem to be a possible view in the face of, of this possibility. So it's hard to su support the definition of death in terms of death of the whole brain.